So hi everyone. So welcome back to our CSML seminar series, which is kindly sponsored by DeepMind. So today we have a great pleasure of having Greg Yang as a speaker. Uh, Greg studied at Harvard University, where he received honorable mention for the 2018 Morgan Prize for outstanding research in mathematics by an undergraduate student. For the last few years. He has been working at Microsoft Research AI on developing tensor programs for understanding why neural networks and computational graphs using, for example, the neural tangent kernel. And today he will talk about feature learning in infinite width neural networks. And if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. And the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thanks, Anthony, for hosting the invitation and the introduction. So I'll just get started right away. Um, yeah, so the, the topic today uh, is on feature learning in infinite width neural networks. And this is uh, based on a work with uh, Edward Hu, who is a Microsoft AI resident and is full-time right now. And this is uh, part of the tensor M series, uh, which um, in which I essentially uh, explore different consequences of this overall technique called tensor programs. And I'll speak a little bit about what Tensor programs are later, but um, here's the main outline for the conversation today. So uh, I'll preface my discussion by talking about pre-training and transfer learning and why they require feature learning. And then I'll come back to talk about the other side, uh, the current theoretical understanding of your networks. And uh, the most popular way right now is through this thing called neural tangent kernel. And uh, I'll talk about how this theory contradicts the uh, feature learning we see in practice. And then finally, I'll talk about uh, our proposal, the feature learning limit that uh, resolves this difference. Okay, so um, as any practitioner will know, uh, pre-training and transfer learning is really successful in practice, probably the top most uh, application of deep learning in commercial applications. So, I mean, there are two you know, very prominent examples. One is in image uh, computer vision. So we have ImageNet data set and ResNet family models. Uh, and recently in the language domain, we have stuff like BERT and GPT-3, like large transformers. And uh, of course, in, in both cases, um, uh, the, the paradigms that we pre-train are very large corpus of data. And then we fine tune uh, the model on downstream tasks of concern. Um, and again, you know, they are used everywhere, like in Google search engine uh, and search, uh, so on and so forth. And the, the simple observation, which is, you know, really obvious if you're uh, like work actually, uh, you know, in practice with deep learning is that uh, pre-training and transfer learning cannot happen uh, without feature learning. In some sense, feature learning is the essence uh, of uh, these techniques. So before I move on, let me just pin down what I mean by feature learning. Um, so, uh, so very simply put, uh, a new network can be thought of as a composition of two functions. One is the nonlinear embedding function, which corresponds to the body of the network. And then the other one is a linear function that goes from the embedding space to the output space. And this corresponds to uh, the last linear layer of the neural network. And this is usually called uh, the head of the neural network or the readout layer of the neural network. And by feature learning, I just mean that this embedding function is learned, right? And uh, the, um, the units, the coordinates of the embeddings are often called features. Okay, so uh, you know, concretely here are some you know, visual examples of feature learning. Uh, so, so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, demonstrating the uh, maximal activation uh, images that activate certain neurons. And on the top here are certain neurons in, like, in the deeper layers of ResNet-50. And the bottom uh, are pictures corresponding to neurons in the earlier layers uh, of ResNet-50. Uh, and uh, the, the point here is just that you know, different, uh, different, different neurons after the pre-training, they respond to different signals. Uh, for example, in the earlier layers, they respond to different frequency signals or edge signals 
uh, in the image, whereas in the deeper layers, they correspond to much more complicated patterns, you know, like leaves or um, starfish, something like that. Uh, and of course, this this will contract contrast very much with um, what you see if you look at a random randomly initialized ResNet 50. You know, the, the features will correspond to just kind of random images. So you know, this these images concretely demonstrate that feature learning has occurred uh, in ResNet 50, and they are very important for downstream applications. So earlier, I claimed that. You know, you cannot have transfer learning without feature learning. Uh, and uh, uh, let me just explain this a little bit. Um, so recall, you know, pre-training just means that you're training uh, a large model on a large data set in the general domain. And then during transfer learning, you usually fine tune uh, the model. <clears throat> I continue training the model on uh, some downstream uh, expensive but well-labeled data. And during fine tuning, you usually discard the readout layer from pre training uh, just because pre training usually has a different objective than the fine tuning objective. And then you train a new readout layer. So this is called linear fine tuning. Uh, and the simple observation is that if pre training improves linear fine tuning, then the embeddings, i.e., right, the features of the inputs, must change during pre training. Right. And this is just it's purely because linear fine tuning is a linear problem. You're only training the linear readout layer. So uh, if the features are the same as during initialization, then your pre-training hasn't done anything. Right. So okay, so that's that's one uh, paradigm of fine-tuning. Another one is total fine-tuning, where you train the entire neural network uh, on the downstream data set. Uh, here the conclusions, uh, the same conclusions will apply, but the 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 chain of reasoning is a bit more sophisticated. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about uh, pre-training and transfer learning uh, and, the, and the requirement of feature learning. So now I'm going to jump to the other side of the fence and look at uh, our current understanding of uh, neural networks through the neural tangent kernel. So the idea of this thing is actually quite simple. Um, we, we do a naive first order Taylor expansion uh, of the neural network, F. So, uh, so this means that, uh, so the, this equation here means that the changing of the, changing the neural network uh, due to changing parameters is approximately equal to the changing parameters times the gradient uh, of F at the initialization, right? And again, this is just naive first order Taylor expansion. And um, the, the, the nice thing about this is of course that, you know, like without doing Taylor expansion, the neural network might evolve in a very nonlinear uh, fashion uh, throughout training, and it's hard to analyze. But you know, assuming this first order Taylor expansion is reasonable, we can essentially reduce the trajectory or the evolution of neural network uh, into a linear equation. Uh, and we can rewrite this equation as a kernel equation, like so, where the kernel is induced by the, the inner products of the gradients. Um, so you know this is really nice again because uh, it really re it reduces the possibly really complicated uh, neural dynamics into something fairly simple, fairly linear. So for example, with a quadratic loss, this this means that you know your uh, optimization landscape is now uh, roughly quadratic. <clears throat> uh, and um, in fact, you know as a width goes to infinity in a certain parameterization called the NTK parameterization, this this linear dynamic actually becomes exact. So like all of the, like this, this tilde, sorry, this uh, approximation symbol here can actually be replaced with equality in the infinite width limit. Uh, and this is, uh, again, this is really nice because it's linear and it yields a lot of optimization and generalization results uh, for neural networks, uh, resolving some of the really longstanding problems uh, in the field. So this was really a great advancement in our understanding of neural network at the time. But coming back to what I talked about earlier about you know, feature learning in the context of pre-training transfer learning, uh, the one fatal weakness of this theory is that this limit does not allow you to learn features. So I'll explain a little bit uh, why this is the case, but consequently, you know, pre-training as I talked about before, 
is no better than random neutralization in the NDK limit. So, you know, for example, bird, uh, if, if actually it's, it lives in the NTK limit, then bird wouldn't give you anything other than like a randomly initialized bird. Right. Okay. Again, you feel free to shout out any questions you have. Uh, so let me explain a little bit why the NTK limit does not learn features. Um, but the, uh, the, the main reason is really quite simple. Again, uh, we started by doing a first order tail expansion of uh, the neural network in the parameters. So for this tail expansion to be reasonably accurate, you want the, the change in the parameters theta minus theta zero to be small. But if that, that is small, then essentially the embedding function cannot change too much, right? And that essentially says that the features cannot change too much. And you know, in the infinite width limit, that this actually means that the features don't change at all. Okay, so uh, that's probably kind of a track. So let me give you a concrete uh, example uh, where you can visualize a difference uh, in feature learning between uh, NTK and finite neural networks, as well as the the feature learning limit that I'll propose later. So just to just a brief recall of Wordtovec for people who might not know what it is. It's just like a uh, word embedding. Uh, so Wordtovec means uh, you have you have some pre-training procedure. You can learn uh, you can learn to associate vectors to words such that um, words that are semantically close uh, are geometrically close in the embedding space. Um, okay, so here in our paper we did some experiments. Uh, and we trained a uh, 64-dimensional word to vec embedding, uh, as well as uh, the NTK limit of this. So this corresponds to infinite dimensional embedding, but in this NTK style limit. And then we also did uh, our feature learning limit, uh, which is something that I'll explain a bit later. Um, so, um, so here in each plot, we took two groups of words, here corresponding to uh, US cities and US states. Uh, and then we, we uh, looked at the PCA uh, of these word embeddings, right? So if you look at the, the middle plot, which is the 64 dimensional embedding, uh, they naturally separate into two groups, two clusters. Uh, and uh, this just indicates, of course, that the word embeddings were able to pick up the semantical difference between these two groups of words. Uh, now, if we look at the NTK example, we see none of that. Like everything's all mixed up together, uh, it just looks random, right? So this indicates that in the NTK limit, you have learned essentially nothing uh, from pre-training. And finally, on the right, uh, the feature learning uh, limit that we propose, uh, you see the same pattern as the, the 64 dimensional embedding, but the in fact the separability of the two clusters are even more so than the 64 dimensional embeddings. So uh, this indicates, of course, it does learn features. And two, uh, it actually does it better, at least you know, from this visualization, uh, than the, the final width case. Okay. Um, okay, so this is just a visual example. You might say, okay, I probably cherry picked this, uh, which is not really true, but, um, uh, but we can also look at uh, concrete numbers on a downstream task. Um, so word to vec embeddings are usually evaluated uh, on something called a word, to, word analogy task, uh, which involves you know, these kind of famous questions like, what to a queen is a man to a woman? Um, and so in these tasks, you have a corpus of these questions. You want to answer as many of them correctly as possible. Uh, and the, the way you do it is, you essentially here for the for example in this question you take the embedding of man subtract the embedding of woman and you add the embedding of queen and then you look at you know which word has the embedding closest to this linear combination. All right, so we have concrete numbers for this. Uh, in this plot, we're showing the essentially the the test accuracy curve, uh, where the x-axis is the training epoch, y-axis is the accuracy. Um, so uh, we have a bunch of different curves. Uh, the solid curves indicate the finite dimensional embeddings. Uh, 
the the dash curves. Uh, the dash curve, black dash curve at the top, uh, indicates the uh, feature learning limit that uh, I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, and uh, the dash dot uh, line at the bottom indicates the NTK curve. Um, OK, so it's obvious there are a couple of things going on. Uh, the first thing is that the NTK limit has trivial performance, right? It's essentially a zero. And that's just because, uh, like I said, you know, like we observed in the visual example earlier, the NTK limit doesn't learn any semantics. So the word embeddings are kind of like the same, just random, the same initialization. So uh, when you uh, perform this word analogy task, it just randomly guessing among the corpus, uh, among the vocabulary. And because the vocabulary is so large, uh, the, the random guessing accuracy is essentially zero. And the second observation is that um, if you look at you know, the final width curves, uh, as well as the infinite width feature learning curve, the performance uh, is actually monotonic uh, in terms of width. So as width increases uh, for any vertical slides corresponding to a fixed training time, we see that uh, the performance uh, is better as you as a curve gets darker. In other words, uh, the model gets wider, culminating in the infinite width feature learning limit performance. All right. So this indicates that um, again, you know, our proposed limit indeed learns features, uh, and it does it in a way that's such that wider is better. Right. So this indicates you know this notion that I'm going to introduce a feature feature learning limit does indeed capture uh, the right behavior in finite width neural networks. We also have other experiments on uh, meta learning and future learning with MAML. So the conclusions are the same. Uh, and I won't talk about them here, but you, you know, feel free to look at our paper uh, if you're interested. OK, so that's all I'm going to say about uh, the new tangent kernel uh, as well as the experimental results in our paper. Uh, now I'm actually going to get to you know, what we propose in our paper. But let me just pause here briefly in case anybody has questions so far. I have a question, actually. Yeah. Uh, so you said that the features in the infinite limit, they basically don't change much. So, so what changes if the features don't change? How? How come we get yeah. a good model? Yeah, for in the neural tangent kernel case, right? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, essentially what happens uh, in the NTK case is that um, the body of the network, it changes by an infinitesimal amount, uh, such that the this embedding function doesn't change at all in the infinite width limit, but like, uh, so, so maybe think about it like this, like the embedding function doesn't change in the infinite width limit, but it, it changes by like one over square root of width amount, which vanishes as the width goes to infinity. And so, so the, the change in the, in the embedding function doesn't affect the embedding itself, essentially, but uh, this change interacts with the final linear layer. So that like when, when you multiply the change by the final linear layer, it, it produces uh, a constant change in the function output. So that makes sense? So yeah, the, the primary sense. change is through the delta of the embedding with the final linear layer. And also you know, from the delta of the final linear layer with the initial embedding function. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? All right. Um, Okay, so before uh, we begin proper uh, talking about what the limit is and what does that even mean, uh, let me preface by saying, uh, you know, when, when we want to look at infinite width limits, uh, it's actually very useful to look at it through the lens of parameterizations of finite neural networks, right? Uh, so in parameterization, you know, means, you know, some combination of, you know, initialization, uh, like a learning rate or you know like temperature or the softmax like that kind of stuff you know different ways of parameterizing your neural network even though it's, it still lives in the same 
uh, function space. Um, so for example, you know, the NTK limit I talked about earlier is it, induced by something called the NTK parameterization, uh, which uh, I didn't talk uh, in detail about, and I won't talk very much in detail about, but that's an example where the you have infinite with limit induced by uh, a finite neural network parameterization. So in this work, uh, when I talk about the feature learning limit, is induced by something called the maximal update parameterization that we also propose in this work. And I'll, I'll tell you about it uh, in a little bit. So if we zoom out a little bit, you can actually look at uh, the space of all parameterizations. Uh, and this kind of, uh, you know, looking at the space tells us where we, we are at and possibly like the best point, uh, the best parameterization uh, we can land on. So if we look at this broader picture of parameterizations, uh, most of them will be unstable or trivial. So unstable here means that, you know, given that parameterization, if you go to the infinite width limit, uh, the dynamics of the neural network uh, will diverge during training. And trivial means the opposite. So it means that if you go to the infinite width limit, the neural network will get stuck at initialization, right? So neither of that uh, of these two things are good. Um, so we can look at the complement uh, of those and the non-trivial stable parameterization will form a high dimensional polytope uh, in the space. And among these, the feature learning parameterizations form two facets uh, and everything else in the kernel regime. So the kernel regime just means that, you know, your function evolution in the infinite width limit is kind of like a linear thing, a kernel equation. Uh, and, and, you know, as example, of course, the neural tangent parameterization is a vertex in this polytope. Uh, in addition, the standard parameterization, uh, if you use the like a constant learning rate, it's gonna blow up, so it's unstable. Uh, but you can use kind of the optimal learning, optimal scaling learning rate, which is one over width, and in which case the the um, the parameterization will induce a kernel limit. Uh, but uh, you cannot set the learning rate in any way such that uh, the, the standard parameterization will lie in the feature learning regime. Uh, and you know, the maximum update parameterization that I mentioned earlier, which is our proposal, is a vertex in the feature learning regime. Uh, and it's maximal in the sense that you will uh, cause all the layers to uh, perform feature learning, right? So which is why I draw it at the very top. And if you know about something called the mean field uh, limit, uh, it has associated parameterization and it's equivalent to maximum update when depth is equal to one. But it's not well defined for uh, deeper layers. Okay, so now I'm actually gonna explain what maximum update parameterization is. Um, the easiest way to explain it is to modify the standard parameterization to get the maximum update parameterization. There are two main modifications. Uh, so uh, with n denoting the width of the neural network, uh, we first modify the last layer. So here we divide the logic by square root n and we use a constant learning rate. Uh, this means that, you know, concretely f, the output of the neural network is equal to one over square root n times the weights, that last layer weights times the embedding of the input where the weights are sample with the fan initialization as usual. Okay, so this modification alone suffices to enable feature learning. And the intuition here is that in the standard parameterization, uh, the last layer uh, is has too large of initialization and it also gets too much gradient. So uh, by doing this uh, reparameterization, uh, we can we decrease essentially the size of the last layer initialization and also we, we decrease the amount of gradient it receives. So whereas you know in the standard parameterization using you know constant learning rate will blow things up because the last layer becomes too large. Uh, here we're using constant learning rate will, will mean that essentially all the a lot of, of the last layer and the body in your network will receive about the same amount of gradient. So they evolve kind of peacefully in coexistence. Okay, so that's the first and the most important uh, modification. Uh, the other modification is in the first layer. 
And here uh, we multiply the pre-activation by square n and we use the fan out initialization in contrast to the usual fan in. So uh, concretely, this means that the first layer pre-activation is now equal to square root n times the first layer weights times the input, where the weights are initialized with fan out initialization. Um, so the fact this is to increase the gradient by a factor of n. And uh, again, the intuition here is that in the standard parameterization, the first layer actually gets too little gradient. And uh, this means that essentially it doesn't move at all compared to the uh, other ways of the neural network. And this reparameterization just uh, fixes uh, that problem. Um, so, so let me note that, you know, like uh, kind of what I said earlier, uh, the problems uh, with the standard parameterizations are just that like different layers kind of receive different amounts of gradient. So you, you could resolve those problems also just by using a, a per layer uh, learning rate. So for example, if the last layer gets too much gradient, you can just try to use a smaller learning rate. Though, though here, there's also a problem with the last layer being initialized too large. So you have to decrease initialization as well. So you could use a per layer learning rate to also solve the, the problems. But, but with this uh, reparameterization, you can keep using a global learning rate uh, uh, you like, but in, in exchange, you have to uh, change the first and last layer uh, parameterizations, which are often easier in, uh, in practice to do than try to use a per layer learning rate for um, gradient descent. Okay, so these two uh, accompany uh, the description of the standard parameterization. Everything else, all the other ways are essentially the same as before. They're, they use band initialization and there's no you know, explicit multipliers or any sort. And like I said, uh, this parameterization allows you to enable feature learning every layer in the large width limit. And uh, just to recap, uh, you know, parameterizations correspond to limit and this, this feature learning limit that I've been talking about is quote unquote, the uh, maximal feature learning limit in the sense that all the layers learn features and is induced by this maximal update parameterization that I just described. Okay, so uh, next up, uh, I'm gonna give you some, some intuition for how the feature learning limit looks like. Um, uh, so, so before that, I wanna again, pause for any questions. Okay, so um, the main intuition behind uh, the feature learning limit, the computing the feature learning limit is the following. Uh, when the width is large, every activation vector has roughly ID coordinates at any time during training. Uh, using tensor programs, this thing called tensor programs uh, I'll describe a bit later, we can recursively calculate such coordinate distributions and consequently understand how the neural network function evolves. So if you have done you know, things like uh, neural tangent uh, kernel or neural network Gaussian processes, the first sentence looks familiar to you if you replace at any time during training with uh, initialization, um, right? And here, just because, essentially just because initialization, you have a lot of randomness and you can use something like central limit to say, oh, like activation vectors have roughly ID coordinates and, and so on and so forth, like propagate the argument. Um, but the surprising thing is that this actually uh, holds at any time during training, and you can take advantage of this uh, to calculate the, the infinite with feature learning limit. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna demonstrate this uh, using the simplest example, the linear 100 layer case. And here I'm gonna assume input and output dimensions are one, just to make it simple. Okay, so, um, so in this case, the new network can be expressed uh, as just you know, some matrix of locations. But here in particular, we can write it as like a row vector times the column vector times the input. Um, and um, so the, uh, the parameterization uh, will require that you uh, randomly initialize your weights uh, initialization. Um, with uh, ID coordinates. 
So in particular here, the, the ID coordinates have variance one over width. Um, and uh, this uh, implies that F, uh, the, the output on your network will converge to some deterministic number by low large numbers. And this is just because, you know, like if you write out what F is, F is, you know, the sum of uh, like the first coordinate, second layer times first coordinate, first layer times I plus, you know, second coordinate, second layer, second coordinate, first layer times I and so on and so forth. So, uh, so you can rewrite this as like a mean uh, of a large number of uh, all one size random variables. So this converges by law of large numbers. Okay. Um, and because F of I converges, uh, the last derivative L prime of F of I also converges, uh, just because L prime is usually uh, a continuous function. So then uh, in the backward pass, uh, we can do some very simple uh, calculation to see that the gradient of the second layer is the first layer weights times some scalars. And similarly, the, the, the gradient first layer is second layer times some scalars, where the scalars are you know, the last derivative and the input. And because you know, this last derivative uh, has a deterministic limit, uh, and because in the weight centralization are ID, uh, the gradients here also have ID coordinates, approximately ID coordinates, right? Um, and consequently, you know, when you make an update to the weights by adding the gradients, uh, you maintain the property that the weights in, in the second and four paths have approximately ID coordinates. Okay. Um, okay. So. Uh, let me make one observation that I won't use immediately, but I'll come back to a bit later. Uh, from the same, you know, insight we just uh, had, we can deduce that the weights at the, at the second the second forward pass uh, are linear combination of weights from initialization, right? And this is just because, you know, like the gradients are linear combinations of the weights and initialization being multiples by these uh, scalars. And when you add them you know, to the weights, uh, they continue to be linear combinations of weights from neutralization. Um, okay, so, so this will be crucial when we, when we actually wanna compute the, the limit exactly. Uh, but uh, for now, let me just focus on convincing you that things are kind of ID uh, doing training. Okay, so you know, given that the weights are approximately ID uh, across the, the width dimension, then the neural network output itself is, uh, again, you know, can be written as a mean of a large number of approximately ID constant size random variables. So F will converge by a lot of large numbers to a deterministic number. And likewise, you know, the last derivative will converge because F does. Okay, and you can see the pattern, right? So, and then because last derivative converges, the gradients will look like approximately ID vectors. Uh, and you can repeat uh, this argument for all T, right? So what this shows is that the, the weights, uh, first layer, second layer weights at any time are approximately ID. Uh, but note that the weights, between the weights, they can be correlated. So I'm saying that the coordinates across are approximately ID, but the, the, the coordinates, like first coordinates, are is gonna usually be co correlated with the first coordinate of the second layer, or the first layer, sorry, second layer with the first layer, and second coordinate will be correlated with the second coordinate of the first layer, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you know this implies, of course, that the activation vectors uh, which is just the first layer weight times the input is also approximately ID. Okay, so this demonstrates the statement that when the width is large, every activation vector has roughly ID coordinates at any time during training. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Okay, so now let me uh, give you the gist 
uh, for actually calculating the limit in this case. Um, so again, we come back to the observation that waste at any time are linear combinations of waste from initialization. So let me introduce a bit of a notation uh, before we move on, just to make the uh, math a little bit more obvious. So let me denote the first layer by U and second layer by B. Um, and uh, let me denote the, uh, uh, so let me, let me recall the, the weights are randomly initialized with variance one over N, uh, where N is width. And let me use subscript T to denote uh, U and V at time T, where uh, if I don't use subscript, it means the uh, U and V at, uh, initialization. Okay, so, you know, again, the weights at any time are linear combinations of weights from initialization. So this means that we can write V and U um, as, you know, linear combinations of initial V and U. So this means that we have coefficients A, B, C, D uh, such that VT is equal to AT times V plus BT times U and UT is equal to CT times V plus DT times U where um, A, B, C, D uh, are, you know, essentially random scalars that converge to some deterministic thing in the infinite width limit. And uh, at time equals zero initialization, uh, A equal D equals one and B equals C equals zero, which just means that V is equal to V and U is equal to U. Okay, so uh, given uh, these expressions for V and U, we can you know, rerun through the law large number reasoning and see that uh, F will look like AC plus BD times input. And here, just because, you know, when you contract uh, V with U to calculate F, we see that uh, the contraction of U with D and V with U will vanish to law large numbers because they're sampled independently uh, and with zero mean. But uh, V and V and U and U will uh, give you one because uh, kind of by definition of V and U. Okay. All right. So the point here is that, you know, once you have a, B, C, D, the coefficients, you get uh, the limit of F, the, the neural network. So to get the limit, it suffices to just get A, B, C, D. All right, so now that's the, that's the goal we have. We want to essentially uh, understand how A, B, C, D evolve with time. And um, you can do some simple calculations. And the point here is that uh, the gradients will, you know, be uh, linear combinations of U and V from initialization, uh, and uh, the coefficients are, you know, uh, uh, obtained from the co the current coefficients as well as the loss derivative and the input. So that means that when you uh, make the update to the weights, uh, you uh, you can see the pattern here emerging where essentially AT will go to AT minus L prime times I and so on and so forth, uh, times CP. Um, but anyway, so here's a summary of the gist. Uh, so at T plus one, uh, you know, AT plus one equal AT minus the last derivative times Xi times CT uh, and so on and so forth for the other coefficients. So again, you know, what, now we know the coefficients, we essentially know what the, what the F looks like, what the neural network looks like in the infinite width limit. So here's a summary of what we've just done. Uh, the feature learning limit of this linear one hidden layer neural network for input output dimension equal one and learning rate equal one is given by the following equations. So F is equal to AC plus BD times input, ABCD evolved like so, and uh, the initial conditions uh, are AD equal one and BC equal to zero. Okay, so this is simple enough. Uh, and it's nice that we, we actually have a kind of clean limit in the limit, uh, in the infinite width limit, um, but we can actually digest this a little bit more. So if we look at the equation for F, it looks like a linear one layer with two neural network uh, where the uh, A's and A and B's are the second layer weights and the C and D's are the first layer weights. And the only difference between this and an actual 
with two neural network in, in practice is that the initialization is like different. So here we have a quote unquote diagonal initialization where ABCD uh, is set to the identity matrix initialization rather than uh, like a random initialization. So we can speculate that the feature learning limit of a linear one layer neural network with random initialization is the same as a with D and plus DL linear one layer neural network with diagonal initialization. And here, you know, in this particular example, D and DL are both one. So, so this corresponds to like the width two uh, neural network. Okay, so this of course turns out to be true in general as well. Uh, when you have, you know, D in and D out are uh, more general numbers larger than one. And this is precisely what we've done to compute the uh, uh, infinite feature, infinite width feature learning limits for uh, large scale experiments like word to vec So in the word to vec example, uh, D and D out are uh, vocabulary sizes. So this means on um, you know text A and field nine that the two data sets we use is 140k and 280k. So this is quite large, uh, but you can do it on a like large CPU machine. Okay, so let me summarize you know the insight you should take away uh, from uh, our example here. So uh, the, the the logic goes like this. Uh, the way matrices have ID coordinates and initialization. So then the function output converges due to a lot of large numbers. Uh, th and then from now we have that the gradients have approximately ID coordinates. So after the gradient updates, weight coordinates are still approximately ID and you re can repeat this logic. So this says essentially that um, like the, the activation uh, vectors will have approximately ID coordinates and you can keep track of how the coordinate uh, evolves. So in the linear case, uh, in our example, we express weights anytime as linear combinations of weights from initialization. And this allows us to have efficient calculation of the limit. Uh, in the more general case where it's not linear, the, the nonlinearity is non-trivial, uh, it's more complicated to calculate the limit. Um, and uh, it's not, in general, it's not as efficient as the linear case. Okay, so any questions? I'm gonna, next, I'm just gonna briefly talk about what, you know, what you need for the deeper case, but let me pause here just to um, answer any questions on the example we have so far. Okay, all right, so let me just talk a little bit about the deeper case. Um, Essentially, the, the problem with the deep uh, neural network, we're analyzing the deep neural network, is that you have um, the uh, n times n Gaussian random matrix in the middle of the neural network. Uh, and this, this has some behavior that's not present you know, for the one hand layer case where the weights have always have one dimension that's finite, uh, which is like the input or output dimension. Uh, so one behavior is the central limit behavior where you know, W times uh, independent X is a Gaussian vector. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, W will correlate with W transpose, right? So like in the forward pass, if you use W, then in the backward pass, you're using W transpose. And there's gonna be correlation between these two that uh, doesn't arise in the neural tangent kernel case because essentially you're just stuck, you're, you're only initialization and such a magic happens that you don't have to worry about this. But in the general case, when you do more than one step of SVD, you have to worry about the correlation. Um, okay, uh, in case you're familiar with uh, AMP, like analyzing any training is similar to AMP, but you don't subtract the onsager correction term. But that's all I'm gonna say about this. Okay, yeah, if you're interested, you know, feel free to look at the paper for examples and more details. So in our examples earlier, we had to make a lot of um, you know, low large number arguments, which are really hand wavy. I mean, it's, it's the right intuition, but uh, we're not being rigorous. And um, also, uh, you know, like is, you never know whether your width is large enough to actually make the argument work. So the tensor program framework is essentially an encapsulation of all the insights we had in a rigorous uh, framework uh, and automates all these derivations. So uh, in all of the calculations with the earlier, you can just uh, essentially follow some mechanic rules and you can uh, get all of the same results. 
Um, so this TensorFlow M framework, you can think of it as a compiler that you know, take any finite width computation, like you know your PyTorch run, and it returns uh, the right math to uh, compute the infinite width limit of that computation. So this, of course, includes training as we we've seen now. Okay, so this is the last slide, and just to mention some uh, other results in the paper. Um, as we've seen earlier in the in the figure of the um, prime transitions, uh, one one contribution in this paper is to isolate a natural class of prime transitions called ABC prime transitions, uh, and they include you know things in the literature like neural tangent kernel, uh, mean field, and standard prime transition. And we can classify these prime transitions. Um, so essentially, you know, they they either uh, do feature learning where they are uh, kernel limit, but can be the same, uh, can be both at the same time. Uh, here, kernel limit means uh, again that the function evolves linearly in the function space, essentially. And some of the interesting consequences from this classification uh, are as follows. So one says that certain functional dynamics are not valid infinite width limits. Uh, for example, higher order generalizations of NTK dynamics. So here, like you would have um, higher order kernels instead of just a rank two kernel in the kernel equation. Uh, and something that's uh, of interest maybe to uh, Bayesians um, is that um, any feature learning limits function values must be zero everywhere in initialization. So i.e. there's no uncertainty. Uh, so in other words, you know, if you want to have a distribution uh, induced by random initialization, uh, then uh, you cannot perform feature learning in the infinite width limit. Uh, but if you want to perform feature learning, then there's no distribution uh, at initialization. OK, so that's all I have. Um, feel free to ask questions, and here are you know, some QR code for links to um, things if you're interested in diving deeper. Well, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. I'll stop the recording Thanks. now so that people can ask questions if they want to.